Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, and this is Krita. Painting or something. I don't remember the title. Why use Krita over Krita uh, um, over other programs such as GIMP, uh, MyPaint, Inkscape, so on and so forth? Well, each of these programs has their own functionality. Inkscape is a vector drawing tool. Uh, and although GIMP and actually Krita has vector drawing tools, it's not going to be the best interface, and it's not going to it's not going to be the thing you want if you're doing a primarily vector-based uh, graphics uh, setup. Uh, GIMP is uh, the longest-running one of these, oh, I'm probably not sure. um, but uh, you may have noticed that age does not necessarily add functionality to GIMP. Uh, Krita is uh, kind of in the same vein as my paint in that the reason to use it is its brush interface, in my opinion. It has really, really good painting uh, and sketching tools. And that is where Krita is important. Um, and it also has, like, you know, by having a certain amount of vector, you can actually do comics really fast with the thing. You can see this stroked with the brush I'm currently using. You can do cool stuff like that. All right, so let's go over the basic interface. If I say File New, since it's on Windows, it might crash. Uh, um, I'm trying to get Linux real hard, but apparently I have a bad right? So it's not Linux's fault, it's my fault. Uh, when you open it, and if you have Krita set to your default setting, you start out with this uh, sort of document. If you're unfamiliar with graphics, a lot of this might be confusing. Uh, 1024 by 768, all of these are pixel dimensions. Uh, if you work in graphics a lot, there's a lot of um, specific ones you might want to go with because they have functionality throughout. For instance, uh, 720 by uh, 1280 is one I use a lot, uh, even though it's not listed, uh, because that's what like YouTube is sized at. That's what a lot of video stuff is sized at. What does CMYK mean? That is cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and uh, I would not recommend that because what that is for is print. Uh, print You print using CMYK and uh, I don't really care. But that's one of the reasons you might choose Krita over GIMP is I believe GIMP still does not have CMYK support. Uh, RGB is red, green, and blue. Uh, and that's the one we want. They also have comics templates. I don't know what these are. Uh, crap. Is this the? I know they just ported this to Windows recently. <laughs> just it, just yeah. recently, it's a beta on Windows, okay. and it's yeah. really solid on Linux. Yeah, um, Linux is it's really awesome on Linux. Uh, they have all sorts of features like um, the gradient tool. I think I mentioned this. Uh, Could you move it? Uh, move the screen a little bit. To the Oh, am I missing my tool palette? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like that. Is that better? That's good. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> this is one of the reasons you should use it on Linux. We are going to be using a walking tablet today. I'm using a 2 S3. Uh, so. Go buy one. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the basic interface of Krita. And you open it as it opens, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I have very low attention span with Krita, so I very frequently I'll draw something and then I'll just fill the canvas with white, thus deleting it forever. So I'm going to go RGB, let's go 1600 by 1200. All right, so when you open this, you have several sections of the screen that we're looking at. Over here to your left, yeah, uh, you have the tools palette. This is going to be where you select several different uh, tools that you can use. Some of the primary categories uh, that you can think of tools divided into 
is first off, you have selection tools, which let you grab pixels. Uh, and <coughs> these are very handy. We'll be using this later, these later in the demo. You have brush tools, which is primarily this setup. So there you can see we came to the inside of the selection. And there's a straight line brush, which lets you do the equivalent of uh, holding shift in other programs. And then there are vector tools, where you can draw vectors. Um, I think you might have to set them to vectors. Maybe use that. One of the best uh, vector tools that, it, that uh, Krita has is the perspective grid tool. And this is really handy if you ever try to draw in perspective. What it lets you do is give you guides to drawing. So if I start clicking on the screen, you can see I start to draw out this grid. And I can modify it to look, look more perspective -y or less. And then you can expand this to have buildings and so on uh, by clicking on the center lines and dragging up to get new perspective grids. Uh, if you've ever tried doing this in another program, it's awful. So Krita does this really well. And very quickly, we have something where we can draw into this room with a solid sense of how the perspective lines are going to go. And you can see how they all have like these little lines, these little X's. The X's um, off in the distance are usually their, um, their vanishing points. So this one has one way up here. So Oscar, I already know the answer to this, but I need to ask you anyway. Yeah. I, I, can, I requested that you make this presentation. You didn't know anything about it before you did it. So how long have you been working to get this degree of facility with the program? I would say um, you know, uh, about an evening a week and then one or two long-term solid projects. Um, but the like real weeks. answer is a lifetime. I mean, but you started weeks ago yeah. with this. Um, and here's one thing I will say. Uh, is anyone here really comfortable in a current software package for drawing? Like, Are you really comfortable with GIMP? Or Please do you speak. have a favorite? Anyway? If you do, uh, in some ways, you don't have to learn a new program. What you can do? Uh, is every time you would press a button for a hotkey in GIMP and it doesn't work, go to uh, your settings, configure shortcuts, and find out what that hotkey is and change it to the one you're used to. So my GIMP is probably unusable to you guys. Uh, but uh, that's because I just changed a lot of the hotkeys. So uh, another way that you can learn the hotkeys really well, I love this about uh, Krita's uh, hotkey manager, is you can sort by shortcut. Look at this, every shortcut in Krita, all ready for you to learn. That's, you know, two pages worth. All right, so those are tools that you can use. Um, we're primarily going to be using the brush tool today, because that's my preference. Uh, up here on the top, you have tool options. Sometimes it's for global things, sometimes it's for specifics. Uh, one thing to note is these two boxes here. These are your foreground and background colors. And you can toggle them with X and reset them to black and white with D. You're going to do lots of different color changing things. Uh, but that's similar to other graphics programs. Here you can change your brush settings and you can see all the presets. And what's really nice in Krita is you can immediately just go over here and try any brush out. So uh, we can look at our hatching brushes woo, and just immediately try them. I'm kind of mad at these. You mentioned the vector drawing tools. Is this does it create bitmap from the vector, or uh, is because this is a bit a bit drawing program? Yeah, um, it gives you. I think you can draw it, and then I think it does draw it uh, bitmaps. But I believe there's a way you can uh, still try to get rid of all these grids. 
Why did I say this tool is cool? <laughs> so I believe you can use the pen tool and then, I don't know, there's a lot of uh, palettes, um, but you know, I mean once again, I don't think Krita is the best vector <laughs> drawing tool, so it's not the one I use for vectors. Um, and I would say that to you. If you want to do vectors, use Inkscape. Um, Krita gets its vector functionality from Carbon, doesn't it? it just yeah, um, all this is part of like the KDE Caligra suite. And you know, there's some sort of voodoo with how they use libraries together. I've heard like a buddy of mine refuses to use Krita because of other things. So, I don't see why it's that big a deal. But, uh, all right, so you have your tool settings. Uh, when you're using a brush, some of the main ones you're going to use are opacity and flow. Uh, opacity is the strength of your brush, so it's going to be more gray. And flow is the frequency with which it comes out. And most brushes, um, a lot of these brushes are using code under the hood that makes them experimental. And as a result, either opacity or flow will be disabled on them. But let me show you a flow brush. So this, I can change the flow. And you can see that it's a little softer. It's not that the opacity is changing. I can go really dark on a single stroke. But it flows out really slow. And then lastly, on the interface side of things, you have dockers, which appear on the right side. The primary dockers that I like to use are an image browse gallery, and then that image shows up here, and the layers palette. There are, you can look at all the dockers by going to settings, dockers, and you'll see that a lot of these are very, very similar. There's about six different ways that you can have a color palette in Krita. You can have uh, digital colors, advanced color selector, channels, specific color selector, uh, art color selector, that if you like color, Create is a great program, I guess what I'm saying. And then there's a few other ones that deal with vectors, which, once again, I don't really care about. So stroke, um, add shape, uh, palettes. Those are sort of, oh man, I finally killed my walking thing. Fun. All right, let's see. I don't know this talk by heart in the same way I don't like the Blender talk. All right, so let's talk about walking tablets. Here we have a walking tablet. It has buttons on here. And you have a pen. And your pen is going to have two buttons. When you install your walking tablet software, you have to change these settings around. I don't know why, but if you search Wacom, its program doesn't come up. Here you can see. Uh, but this is a Windows thing. Yeah, this is a Windows, but um, it should work on all these. Uh, it does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You'll have to look up Linux's specifics. But uh, Linux does have support for walking tablets, so you're still going to be able to map all the buttons. The first thing to note is how you interact with the screen, which I don't know if I can change that here. Uh. So it's really hard to use a walking tablet when you first get used to it because you're used to a mouse. And the difference is that on a Wacom tablet, this corner, oops, it didn't correspond. This corner corresponds to this corner of the screen, and this corner corresponds to this corner of the screen. Maybe I should stop clicking things, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So if you have this mouse mentality that you're going to keep uh, repeatedly dragging and it's going to go further, it's going to mess you up. So just get used to that idea that this equals the screen. And if possible, maybe consider a walking tablet that's the same size as your computer screen so that at that point you don't have to deal with any sort of distortion. On the grip pen settings, you can change uh, what the buttons on here do. Uh, I have both of mine set to right click because as I mentioned, my right click, both of these are dying so I just have to mash on them really hard to get a right click. Uh, and oh, here's the mapping thing. So you can change it to mouse mode, but don't. Bad habit. Yeah. 
You can also change the function buttons on here. And I have uh, several setup. You can see I have Control, Shift, Alt, and Keystroke. And what this keystroke is, is it's set to spacebar. So space, and then you name it. I don't know why they have you name it. But that means when I hold this, it'll do spacebar. The reason for these hotkeys is uh, those uh, those assorted. Okay. So those four buttons modify brushes and how you act with the interface really well. Spacebar, uh, at least how I have it set, uh, activates the hands tool temporarily. So I can very quickly move my canvas around, um, which is this button here. If I hold this button, um, it's the equivalent of holding uh, shift or alt or something. Uh, but what it does is it lets me use the color picker immediately. So I can go here, uh, and grab this color, and then go here, and start drawing. And then this is a really fun way to draw, which is uh, you sort of paint halfway there, and then you select a sort of middle tone color, and then you continue painting. And then that's one way you can get a gradient really fast. The color picker isn't showing up up here. Huh? We can't see it. You see uh, yeah. the eyedropper? Oh, 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 the yeah. eyedropper. Yeah, the eyedropper. Yeah. That's yeah. the cool. color picker, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Pardon my terminology. No, I. No. And then lastly, I have one of these set to shift. And shift is really nice in uh, Krita. Many, many programs don't have this, including $500 Photoshop. Um, if you hold shift, uh, you can automatically. Just drag, click and drag on the screen to resize your brush. Uh, in GIMP, you have to you know, hit the bracket keys to make it bigger or smaller, which I have set as a legacy shortcut to still do that. Uh, let me see. So that's basically how you set up a Wacom tablet. And another thing I'll say is that sometimes the drivers don't function when you uh, launch a program. So what you want to do is before you launch the program, make sure you have your Wacom tablet plugged in and your pen sort of on the screen. I don't know why. It, um, it might just be that my Wacom tablet's old, but uh, I often have to do that. All right. So once again, have I mentioned that Krita is really good with color? In fact, there are six different hotkeys to really quickly select color in Krita. You have S, which gives you the overall uh, color picking. So I can choose a hue and how light, how dark, how saturated it is. There's M, which gives you the my paint style uh, color picker. Where you can sort of go to a quadrant, you can start mixing, you can say how light or dark you want it. Um, so this goes from the current selection to white, this goes from the current selection to black. There's N, which gives you the, I don't know, um, it just lets you go between two colors. Um, there's L, which I don't know what, oh yeah. Um, L and K make the color lighter or darker. You can see it up here, if you look at this, uh, where I switch my two colors. I can make it darker or lighter by hitting L and K, which are thankfully right next to each other. And then lastly, C brings up a palette of all the colors that have been used in the scene. And lastly, right-clicking in Krita is really good because it gives you this, um, it gives you a palette that's auto-generated based on what you've used in the scene. So right now, all I've used is, um, you know, blacks, grays, and whites. So that's what shows around, there, around here. And we also have the internal color picker. So I can start adding some blue. And now when I right-click, uh, you can see that there's a blue swatch. <laughs> Excuse me, a quick question. Yeah. Is there any uh, facility in the color picker to show the hex equivalents or the RGB? On the uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. uh, Go on and ask the Korea people to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what would be ideal is you hold the color picker and it right. hovers down at the bottom <coughs> wherever the covering does it. Um, if you draw me out, I'll pass that one. Yeah. 
Once again, if you're used to uh, hotkeys from one program, just change it to be those hotkeys. Uh, first thing I did in GIMP when I used it was I got mad because instead of P for pen and B for brush like it is in uh, Photoshop, it's, it's arbitrarily changed to B for paintbrush and B for bezier. I'm still mad about that. All right. So that's sort of just the basic idea of the interface. But let's talk about actually doing some uh, some painting. So really fast, I want to talk about layer theory um, because you can add layers down here. Um, if I add this one and I draw on this, and I add another layer uh, and draw on top of it. It's basically like sheets of paper on top of each other. If you've never used uh, a paint program, it's possible you don't know what that means. Uh, when you're painting something, you end up with this idea of uh, six or so layers that you're going to deal with. First off, you're going to have your line art. So really quick, I'm just going to draw a really ugly circle. So this could be our line art. There we have a circle. We should have a background uh, below that. Because this is black line on top of white, I'm going to set it to multiply. And that's going to make white basically disappear um, and show up uh, below here. So now if you see, you know, I can paint on the layer below the line art and uh, all the white that's on this layer is not occluding it or showing it. So if I change it back to normal, you can see that nothing shows because there's white there. That's a, a very common thing that you do with line art, especially if you draw it in a sketchbook and scan it in. Uh, so really fast, <clears throat> I'm going to add a gradient. Could you move to the right again so that you can see the toolbar? Ah. Good. <coughs> All right, so I think there are a few layers that you're going to want. First off, you have your line art. You are able to have your background before that. Next up, um, to describe this in the terms that uh, painters usually use, you have uh, your primary sort of color layer. So I'm going to fill that in really fast with. Oh, sure, let's use this. So let's say this ball is green, greenish. Okay. You could perhaps use a circle. I'm just going to fill that with. So this would be the overall idea of our sphere. In painting, uh, when you're describing how light affects an object and how you know it casts shadows, you can think of the idea as like snow falling on something. Um, it's going to hit the roof, and it's not going to hit. Um, your porch because the roof is covering it. Um, so let's talk about shadow first. Uh, using this same selection, uh, is there anything to select by layer? Oh, I don't think there is. Maybe there is. So let's say we have a layer on top of that. This is going to be our shadow layer. Uh, and there's more to shadow than just shadow. First, we're going to use what's called a core shadow. And a core shadow is the idea that as the snow is falling, there's going to be a sense of uh, a line where it stops falling past. And this line is called your terminator. I'm going to change my flow down. And below this, it fills in with shadow. You also have 
a cast shadow. So you have your core shadow and cast shadow. And this one, I'm going to put below the object. That's going to go in that direction of where the snow fell. So those are the two shadows you have. Your core shadow, which is on the object, and the cast shadow that it puts on objects below it. You then have two main lights. Uh, first off, you have your main light, which we already sort of have, uh, as you can see, uh, just by not coloring the shadow. You then have a highlight, which I'm going to switch to white. I'm going to just go here. And you also have bounce light, or reflective light, which is when light hits the ground and bounces up. Uh, you might think that mirrors and metal is reflective, but in fact, everything on Earth is slightly ref reflective. When you go out in a grassy field, uh, that grass is going to bounce green light back up on you. Um, and one thing to know about this is reflected light, every time light bounces off a surface, it loses energy. So this reflected light is going to be less aggressive than our highlight and even our core shadow light. So I'm in fact going to select this. I'm going to hit M, you know, slightly darker. And I'm just going to So what is the shape? See the thing with your uh, cursor? What is oh, that? So about? that's just um, the shape of the brush I'm using. Oh, okay. uh, it's like an image or something. Okay. Uh, there we are. I was painting on the other And arguably, instead of that, it's going to. I want a color picker. It's going to be the color of the ground <coughs> below. Okay. Right. Not my best circle ever, but you get the idea. So, this is sort of the way that you end up. Uh, painting by layer. Uh, Would there be a cast effect on the shadow, the uh, cast shadow? Uh, as in, like, would I uh, can light reflect into it? Yeah, I'm saying yeah. here normally. Yeah, you can add that. Uh, so that's sort of the idea of how you can set up layers if you're trying to paint something. Uh, and work with them. Let's talk about the different brushes that Krita offers. I'm going to throw all of these into uh, I don't know how you do this yet, but you can use group layers to uh, to store layers together. I hope this doesn't change the order. What did you use before you started using Krita? Uh, mostly Photoshop and arguably Blender. Um, I think Blender is like a hardcore um, development sprint away from being a better 2D image program than GIMP. Uh, but I tend to evangelize Blender a little too much. All right, so I'm going to hide this whole layer and start over. Let's get a new paint layer. So you can alter the relative position of the layers by moving them, that's what you're doing yeah. now? So is toward the top, toward the front, or toward yeah, the top, um, toward the back? The higher up the layer, that's like the, if these were all different pieces of paper, it's the piece of paper that's stacked higher than the others. I don't know how to do the layer outside of the group layer now. Okay, starting from. So let's talk about the different brushes in Krita. I really enjoy Krita's brushes. Uh, first off, to be on the right layer. If you hit B, you get this. 
If you click on the brush icon up at the top, you can see all the different types of uh, brushes they have. And they're doing lots of cool experimental stuff that I don't understand. Uh, the pixel brushes are the standard brushes that would work like you assume in other programs. <coughs> Oftentimes they have a bitmap image that they're using to repeat over and over. Uh, you can also go to custom brush. Here's how you do this. It's kind of tricky. You have to first, if you want to create your own brush, you have to create a created document with that brush. So I'm going to say custom document 256 by 256. And I'll just make an interesting pattern really fast. Uh, I can select all and go to the brush palette again. Go to custom brush. And it's going to create a brush using that image that we have right now. Um, and then we can say add to predefined brushes. Uh, use this brush. And now we should be able to go to pixel brushes. And We should be able to find it way down here at the end. Maybe. There it is. Now we can use this as a brush. <coughs> oh yeah. Uh, use color as mask is something you want to set so that it assumes that the white is not part of the picture. And so now we can go back to our other document. I'll hear my computer slowly die. It's bad RAM. Uh, there we are. And now we can use that brush we made. Some of the presets are really awesome. First off, you have all these images. Uh, and when you click on this button, you have this palette off to the side where you can test any of these brushes. How do you get back to the drawing? Uh, you just hit escape. Okay. You can just do that. <laughs> you can just play around. Some of these um, are really good. They try to mimic, for instance, this is a loaded brush. Uh, I think one of these I made. Um, specifically for the purpose of mimicking uh, Bob Ross in a way. Yeah. Ah. So this one is uh, a brush design around the idea that when you when you draw a little shrubbery, um, trees are primarily black actually, like they're very dark objects. Um, they have all these pine needles that are casting shadows on other pine needles. And then only on the direct top do they suddenly have light hit them. So I designed this brush so that I can go like this and then lower the pressure. <coughs> they can be little bushes. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like hair. Yeah. There we are. So it's supposed to be like you can push really hard and it'll feel dark, and then you push lighter and it'll be light on top. And so, like, you know. When you watch Bob Ross, he, he does this all in one stroke uh, because he loads his brush with like dark colors and then light colors. And so you can push really hard and, or he starts pushing with uh, the dark colors and then he pushes really hard and that goes down to the light colors. Um, and the way you set this up is using all these different settings in Credo. So you can see I have uh, mix as an option that's clicked. And the reason, uh, and what Mix does is it's switching between uh, the foreground and background color using a gradient mapped to pressure. So now, as I put add less pressure, it goes to the foreground color. And you can map all sorts of cool things to this. <coughs> going back to going back to the brush presets. Um, you can see a lot of these have different settings. 
such as if you push harder, does the spacing change? And you can change any of these by just adding, let's, let's switch it to mirror. And you know, one thing I like doing is setting uh, you know, predefined brushes. I like setting the rotation to pressure. So now I can go light and then you know, let's get a, something like this and map it to rotation. So map this to pressure. So now, as I push, the rotation changes. So if I go light, it's all over the place. And as I push harder, it's different. It's also really good to uh, set it to drawing angle. I don't know why this menu is so huge now. There's supposed to be a reset canvas button. Uh, but drawing angle is really good, because then the angle that I am stroking will change it. And so you can, do, um, you can do lots of different patterns in a single stroke that fall along a contour. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can you can just play around with all these different presets. You go to you can see all of them by going brush tip and then predefined brushes. Uh, you have bricks. You have marijuana. You can have butterflies. Oh, no, no, that's leaf. If you look over on the side panel, you can see all sorts of other cool brushes. Uh, the smudge tool I don't think works on mine. But the color smudge tool is a very handy brush indeed. Very similar to smudge brushes on uh, GIMP or Photoshop. So by doing this, I can sort of drag pixels into each other. I can also go to uh, hairy brushes, which this is one that I use a lot. Uh, if I increase my size. a fun way to fill things in. I think the best brushes, though, are the sketch brushes. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Mr. Dube? No? Mr. Dube was a guy who did lots of HTML5 experiments. Um, if you're interested <coughs> in HTML5, you can go look at all these different things. But one of the best things he did was this program, Harmony. And it created this idea that as you draw a stroke, um, it creates a like, relationship with other strokes within that. And this is just a little doohickey on a website. Um, I was very, very excited to try Krita and realized that they have Mr. Doom brushes, which are the sketch brushes. So all of these, as you draw a stroke, will sort of fill in between them. So one reason I like these is uh, you can very quickly sketch with them, and it feels very similar to drawing in real life, in my opinion. Uh, essentially, if you go slower, more ink comes out.
Well, I gave it back to you. Oh, okay. It's in that edge. <coughs> Could you say something about what color printers might work well with this device? Not really. I don't believe in print. It's bad for the environment. Down with analog media. Um, but uh, I would say the main thing that you need to know is uh, create images. At, so if you got a file and you Looking for a good color printer to be able to print stuff. Yeah. Um, use one of the ones that has the multi individual inks. The multi what? Multi individual inks, you know, like mm -hmm. HPs and I think like Smarts has some. They all have an individual cartridge for each color. Right. Um, oh, so you can reload C and YK individually? Not only that, but they have finer detail. Yeah. So. That's cool. Yeah, in my, in my experience, um, I'm not willing to shell out for like a $300 printer. And so if it's something where color is important to me, I just go to a print shop. Um, and then I print all sorts of crap at home that's really terrible detail. But you can see, you know, like all that stuff I talked about, um, you know, ground slide, uh, highlight and stuff. If you follow the formula, and you get really, really good at the formula. You can just bust faces out really, really fast. Um, what do you mean by the formula? Uh, the the idea of you know uh, core shadow, uh. you know, cast shadow, and like you know what I like about these sketch brushes is that you can see I can just um, put bounce light in um, automatically. It'll just bleed very quickly. And so basically all I'm doing with uh, the ground face is assuming it's uh, a sphere with a little triangle on top of it for your nose, with a little ice cream scoop out for your eyeballs, um, with a little overhang for your lip, and then a little protrusion for your bottom lip. And so that's all I'm doing is I'm assuming, you know, this, this bottom lip, I'm just assuming that it's a rounded out sphere. Uh, on top of another sphere. And same thing with uh, the upper lip. Is, you know, the upper lip really is just uh, a really harsh terminator um, that's light on this side and then dark on the bottom. But then you have your nose that's casting a shadow onto it. I mean, if you, wanna, if you want to, like the bad news is, although Krita is cool, it's not gonna make you a good artist. But the good news is, there are a lot of dorks out there who spend $500 on Photoshop, and it doesn't make them a good artist. I just want to let you know we have about five minutes. Okay, let's see. Do I have anything else I want to say? Uh, let's look at more brushes, because once again, that's the fun stuff. Uh, they have Dyna brushes, which are really cool. Woo! Instead of jaws, um, assuming that it's almost like you're, you're swinging a yo-yo. <laughs> uh, it's not really useful, but the, you could use very easily to, you know, some sort of frou-frou graphic design for like a bakery or something, some sort of logo like that. I mean, it was a background, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone likes swirly crap. Um, the hatching brushes are really fun, too. Um, you can check them out. They have really cool settings under how they work. My favorite hatching brush is this one, which is like, um, oh, ooh, I have to show you this. So first off, if you look at this, it's like a canvas texture brush. And so you can very easily add in a very nice texture. And then really quick, I want to show you how to add brushes to your palette. So when I've been right-clicking, and you can see all the colors that I've used in the scene, it's also got this wheel of brushes that uh, I've been using as hotkeys. So here's a smudge brush, for example. Here's another smudge brush. Um, 
Here's my Bob Ross brush. Uh, the way you can add palettes is you go to save to palette and you get this menu. You see all the different brushes. It's really kind of unfortunate because it doesn't hover and tell you what brush, or it hovers and tells you what brush it is. But you can't sort of sort by category. So what you need to do is when you're looking at brushes here and you find one that you really like, like this, ah, what is this? You have to hover on this, remember the name, and go to save to palette and find it. So it's going to be SC, whatever. Eventually, once you say that, you add the palette. You can only have 10, which is probably for the best. Uh, move on. So if I find one that I like, you never have enough sketchy brushes. So there we go, I have a new sketchy brush. And now, when I right click, uh, here it is. Let me think. Lastly, let's look at Krita's awesomest feature, which is mirroring. If I go up here, you can turn on mirror left to right, or mirror top to bottom. Both of them have functionality. Most anatomical creatures are built with uh, uh, bilateral symmetry, meaning we're generally, generally the same on the left to right. And also, reflections happen top to bottom. So uh, if you're drawing a landscape or something, you can just very quickly lay in clouds and stuff, and then have it happen on the bottom. That's going to be your reflection in the water. Well, let's turn on left to right and draw a face really fast. Like this. And you can also go to expert mode by hitting control space bar. Get the general shape of a face. Very quickly. How did it know how far to offset the... It goes in the direct center. It goes what? It goes in the... It starts assuming that the center line is directly ah, okay. in the center of the canvas. So, um, if I start over here, it right. doesn't matter. Alright. Very quickly. Start. And yeah. I really enjoy this. The mirror modifier is really fun. I don't waste a lot of time on it. Sometimes you're getting a mark and sometimes you're not. Uh -huh. like the paper. How did you, what did you do? What I'm doing is sometimes I'm doing a long stroke, and when I do a long stroke, this brush, the sketch brushes, once again, are awesome. Um, it creates a relationship between every part of the stroke. So if I get close enough, it bleeds into itself, you can see. And also, how fast I go makes it lighter or smaller. So oftentimes when I'm drawing and nothing, no ink is flowing out, it's because I'm doing really fast uh, strokes like that. And, you, know, you can even, oops, oops. At this point, I might want to start. Uh, I hate to cut you off, but we're actually at time. Uh, I was going to say at this point. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really cool though.